First of all, I just want to thank you, Dr. Omar, for your talk. Bismillah. The, uh, the book that you wrote, which I, I have in Arabic, uh, about fitra, iman and fitra, um, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya actually read that book and was mm -hmm. very impressed with it. Mm -hmm. the, um, the hadith that you quoted, Kulu Mawlud and Yuladu ala al fitra that the hadith indicates that people are enculturated into customs and beliefs and, and traditions. But then he says, Kama tuntajul bahimatu bahimatan jama'a, just as the animal is created complete or whole in its nature. Hal mm -hmm. Do you mm. notice any mutilations that, that you do as humans mm. to your animals, like cutting their ears and things like that? So it indicates that the fitra is it's, it's a wholeness in nature that's there. Mm -hmm. But the hadith also indicates that there's a whole set of other possibilities to mm -hmm. that, that inherent or principial nature. And one of the things I think that's very confusing for people, in the 20th century, we've seen human nature is denied. Like this idea that we have human nature is mm -hmm. denied and that all peoples, uh, that, that anthropologists and sociologists and social scientists have shown that there's so much diversity in the world mm -hmm. that it's impossible for us to have uh, some type of, mm -hmm. of human nature that unites us all as this hadith would indicate. Mm -hmm. And th there's a very interesting, uh, Herodotus in the histories has a very interesting section where the Darius, the king, brings the Greeks and they honor their fathers mm -hmm. by burning them. Um, mm -hmm. And he asks them how much money would it cost to get them to honor them by eating them. And they said they you could give them all the money in the world, they wouldn't eat, they were horrified by that. Mm -hmm. And then he brings the Indians and who ate their fathers to honor them, and he says, how much money to burn your fathers? And they were horrified by that. Mm -hmm. And Herodotus makes this mm -hmm. comment about how customs mm -hmm. are so different, even though they were both mm -hmm. honoring their, mm -hmm. their ancestors. Mm -hmm. So just in terms of how do you see this incredible diversity of human expression mm -hmm. and, and, and the relationship that it has mm -hmm. to this idea of a mm -hmm. universal nature. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about the fitra, um, you know, then some of the most important verses about it are like Surah the Shams and Surah the Teen, uh, you know, by the fig and the olive and so forth, by the sun and the morning brightness. So these are verse, these are chapters in the Quran which establish that human beings are perfectly created and uh, that there's nothing wrong about them at all. But commentators say that one of the reasons why they're preceded by the oaths is because the oath in Arabic means this is the literal truth. It's emphatic, it's not metaphorical, it's absolutely so. But it needs that emphasis because no one would believe this. And you know that if you look at what people do, especially the evil they do, this also takes on so many forms, it's impossible to comprehend. And it is very clear in the other hadith, we just tonight, as you know, just looked at a very small part. Even the hadith I mentioned, uh, I left out two thirds of the hadith just for time's sake. You know, but um, it's very clear in our tradition that it is the demonic more than anything else that alters the human beings. Right. And they do it a thousand different ways, times a thousand different ways. Um, if we look for proofs of the fitra, then I think one of the greatest proofs of that in the 20th century is the great Austrian um, 
anthropologist Wilhelm Schmidt, and he wrote a book in German, Der Ursprung uh, des, Idee, Gott, des Gottes Idee, The Origin of the Idea of God, never translated into English. And it's 12 volumes. And um, you know, this book is really amazing because he spent his life um, documenting all the so-called primitive religions. Primitive religions being what we call micro-religions. They're kinship groups that don't have political structures. Everything is determined by kinship. And these little groups that we call primitive, they're always very isolated, otherwise they wouldn't be that way. And there are many of them, especially in the 20th century, there still were many that are not there today. And he showed that all of them have the idea of the one God. No exceptions whatsoever. None of them are polytheistic in the sense of having pantheons. Right. Not a single one. And he did that also to refute Lubbock and Tyler, who were evolutionist anthropologists, who didn't do research, by the way. They didn't do good research. And they claim that religion begins with animism. So he showed that's absolutely not true. Mm -hmm. And he himself, who was a Catholic, um, he believed that this was a proof of ancient prophecy. And we wouldn't necessarily disagree with him because these people are so isolated. And yet they have these amazing similarities that pertain not just to the belief in the one God, whom they call by beautiful names. Right. You know, but also they believe in morality. They believe that marriage is given to them by God. They believe in heaven and hell. Some of them even believe in the sirat, right. the path that takes you to the garden. And so we would also say that's a manifestation of fitrah. But like, as you said, human beings no one has a greater um, spectrum of potentials, good and bad, than us. Right. The, um, Nesta Webster, who was regarded before she went into conspiracy theories mm -hmm. as a historian, um, in one of her books, she, she makes that argument that, mm -hmm. that, uh, that Unitarianism was the aboriginal mm -hmm. faith of human beings, that mm -hmm. idolatry mm -hmm. was, was secondary and, mm -hmm. and not primary. So she, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if she was influenced by that German... Mm -hmm. Well, Arnold sort of Toynbee thing. was. Right. That's one of the main influences on Arnold Toynbee. And Arnold Toynbee, who is really a remarkable thinker and uh, you know, historian sometimes or equivocal about whether they want to accept him or not because he's, uh, he, he does what historians are not supposed to do, which is to tell you what it all means. Um, but, um, you know, Toynbee uh, was very deeply influenced by uh, Schmidt and by others. And one of the interesting things about Toynbee is that he believed that the most advanced human beings who ever lived were those of the Paleolithic, of the Old Stone Age. And again, he doesn't say that just off the top of his head. Sure. They didn't build cities like we built cities, but they were spiritually very far advanced. And he bases that on a lot of things, but Schmidt's one of them. Well, mm. it, um, you brought up Toynbee, and I think you were mm. the first one that exposed me to Arnold Toynbee that's kind of become mm -hmm. uh, a very interesting reference that I go back to mm -hmm. uh, at different times. I think some of the students have actually read at least the abridged uh, mm -hmm. version mm -hmm. of Toynbee's study in history. But one of the things that he talks about, he, at the outset of the study, he, he, he argues for the differences, like these differences in civilizations, and he wants to understand mm -hmm. where civilization originated from and what mm -hmm. produces it. Mm -hmm. And he, he basically rejects uh, race, this idea that there's racial mm -hmm. superiority in some peoples as opposed to others. Mm -hmm. he, he, he categorically rejects that. Mm -hmm. But he does m make an argument that there are distinct manifestations mm -hmm. of civilization. And mm -hmm. one of the things that, again, as human expressions, mm -hmm. there's such an incredible diversity on the planet mm -hmm. of human behavior mm -hmm. and expression so would you, would you, do you see civilization as something that unifies human beings mm -hmm. in, 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 from, from a fitra sense, that mm -hmm. humans by nature mm -hmm. begin to create civilization? Mm -hmm. um, you know, language is so important. So 
When we use the word civilization, one of the problems is that it Defining comes from... Defining the term, yeah. It comes from the word city. So it's those great societies that build big cities like Rome mm -hmm. and so forth. And this is where, in our tradition, we use the word Umran. And Umran, to me, is a much better word because of the fact that it has nothing to do with cities. It means bringing things to life. Um, you know, it could refer to Bedouins, just as, although we have Al-Hadar and Al-Badu. But, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, with, uh, with Toynbee and, um, you know, his concept of civilization, this focusing on these civilizations that are big states and so forth, I think that that's, if we had a broader perspective, it would be good. Of course, when he talks about human beings in the Paleolithic, then he's taking that broader perspective. But Toynbee also believes very much in what uh, he calls the creative minority. And one of the most important ideas in Toynbee is that history is uh, always the work of minorities. And uh, therefore, more minorities uh, that are galvanized and that have uh, solidarity, they will lead and they will have great effects. And he believes that civilizations like those of Egypt and those of Mesopotamia and those of ancient China, the Yellow River Valley civilization, the Yellow Emperor, that, you know, um, that these begin by creative minorities. And creative minorities are always inclusive and they're not oppressive and they're a great gift to human beings. And in fact, um, maybe Toynbee hints at this, but we could easily say that they're prophetic. And he emphasizes the fact that to do civilizations like those of Egypt or Mesopotamia or the Yellow Valley in China is such an immense human undertaking that essentially it can't be done without a prophet. It's got to be done with something that can you know, give us uh, divisions in labor and a whole way, new, of way, new way of living. But then the civilizations usually become civilizations of domineering or dominant minorities. And then they oppress and they become the, they become, you know, the profit, they become the property of the elites. And then they create which Toyn, what Toynbee calls the proletariats using that Marxist term, but you have an internal proletariat, which are the oppressed people in the society, and you have an external proletariat, which are usually Bedouin peoples who are also oppressed by that civilization. He would regard the pre-Islamic Arabs to be the external proletariat of the Byzantine and Persian empires. Okay, so they have to keep their distance, but they also learn from them how to use weapons and usually they can often conquer them as well. Sure. But um, I sort of forgot the question. Well, you, mm. no, yeah. okay, it, it's fine. Mm. Mm. Let, let me, let me uh, look at something else here mm. that you brought up. The idea of moving, because you spoke very beautifully about the Adamic mm -hmm. nature and that human beings mm -hmm. are these incredibly honored creatures mm -hmm. But there's also in the Quran, al-insan, which is a difficult word to translate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's the intimate being, it's the being that, uh, that um, represents the essence, mm -hmm. it's the, the ayn, mm -hmm. you know, the insan is the essence of the, of mm -hmm. the, of, of the, the, the eye. But the insan is also talked about qutir al-insan wa ma'akfara. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that, uh, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, the human being was created mm -hmm. in angst and anxiety. Mm -hmm. He's called ajul in the Quran. Mm -hmm. He's hasty. Mm -hmm. um, he's he's mm -hmm. oppressive. You know, ya yuhan nas, innama baghiyukum ala anfusikum. Your oppression is against your own self. Nasa talking to all humanity. Ma dhanamnahum, marakinum anfusum, kanu yaldinimun. We didn't oppress them, but they were oppressing themselves. Mm -hmm. So there's also this other side of the human mm -hmm. being right. that is actually very negative mm -hmm. in the Quran. And mm -hmm. obviously, the Christian tradition deals with that, with the idea of the fallen mm -hmm. uh, human being. Mm -hmm. how, how, how would you? Uh, 
uh, mm. address that aspect of the human being. So this is also part of the fitrah, that it has the negative capacity, right. and it is forgetful. And it has to be forgetful because then it can't use what its fitrah was for, which is to rediscover it. And when we come into life, we believe that all children, uh, until the age of maturity or sometime after that, they're saints, you know, because of the fact that uh, they have this fitrah and they're also not morally responsible, they're not moral agents yet, um, you know, but then as the passions develop in us, then these passions, you know, the, the idol of the pig, the idol of the dog, anger and appetite, right. you know, they will necessarily veil us from who we are. So you have this uh, seeming contradiction between خُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ هَلُوعَ إِذَا مَسَّهُ الشَّرُّ جَزُوعَ with إِذَا مَسَّهُ الْخَيْرُ مَنُوعَ so we have this, but again, our commentators make it very clear that this is a particular type of human being. You know, he is a human being who's not true to his or her fitrah. And um, uh, what was the other part of the well, question? Just, yeah. you know, that idea of looking at the human being yeah. and all these negative qualities. Mm. So w then human nature, if we, if we say there is a mm. human nature that's mm -hmm. universal, mm. I mean, you'd ex Mm -hmm. our, our tradition would argue that. Uh, we would insist upon yeah, it. Insist right? upon <laughs> it. But, but mm -hmm. for us, the nature, and from that mm -hmm. hadith that began the talk, mm -hmm. the nature, the human nature is really a nature of potentialities, of, 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 is, yeah. of capacities. And, yes, and so the yes. actualization, I and mean, we have the concept of it, al insan al kamil. Mm -hmm. You know, this idea of the perfectible mm -hmm. human mm -hmm. being that can move towards a kind of mm -hmm. wholeness mm -hmm. or completeness, which is a restoration mm -hmm. yeah. of, that, of that first mm -hmm. being. Is that, is that, mm -hmm. is that how, how? We you have that. And, you know, uh, of course, I'm a convert. This beloved brother is a convert. Many of the people here are converts. And I remember when I became a Muslim, which was early January the 3rd, 1970, um, and then as I went through that first year, um, there were certain dilemmas I had in my heart from before, like an emptiness, even though I had been religious, and that was filled. And then, you know, believe it or not, you could actually see your face changing in the mirror, especially in Ramadan, like, can I do this? Can I fast this? I've never done that in my life. And then you just see yourself changing. and. So it, it's, this is manifest, I think, to most people who come into the faith. And I remember when we were in Spain, Sheikh Hamza was also part of that, that we had a particular person come to us from the mountains. He was from Madrid. He came from a Stalinist background. He'd become a Buddhist. Uh, he was in a black suit that he could sleep in. It would keep him warm. He did his own Buddhism. And um, then all of his buddies joined us. And uh, he was, we later called him Uthman, you probably met him. And uh, when he came to us, he was frightening. You know, his eyes were like <laughs> about to pop out of his head. Yeah. And we had a madrasa with Sheikh Hamza, I met him there. And we had, it was an Andalusian type of school. And, um, you know, we had a little door that you opened for the window, you know, it's like a window to the door to know who's knocking. And, um, when he knocked at the door, uh, the brother who went to open it shut it just like that. It's like, and then he says, oh my God, like, what if he becomes a Muslim? You know, we, we've got enough crazies in the community already. Yeah. And he kept knocking. And then finally we had to let him in. And then, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun, he took the shahada. And we thought, oh my God, what are we going to do? And uh, I know my wife, Samira, remembers him really well. And like within three weeks, you could not recognize him. And he was also a professional acrobat. And I would watch him from my office looking over the garden, and he couldn't take two steps without doing a, a, a big skip. And the way that acrobats skip is not the way you skip. And he became, he became the most beautiful person in our community. Mm -hmm. And he became a person that, you know, anything you wanted done, even cleaning your house, even doing your laundry, 
uh, you know, sacrificing a chicken, he would be the one to do it. So uh, again, one of the most important things is you can come back to the fitrah. And that's why we say the fitrah can be altered, but it can't be substituted for something else. My wife and I, when we were at Michigan, uh, where I began to teach in 1978, uh, you know, we were in student housing because I was an assistant professor who's always poor. And uh, she was also completing her education, so we were in the graduate housing. And uh, there was a woman there who was a feminist. She was uh, divorced with a child. She was a law student. And um, I don't know why, but she liked us. We liked her. And we always argued. And she's always talking. You, ha you can't get in a word edgewise. And then, you know, one spring day, and she's talking about, you know, that how horrible religion has been to women. And we say that women are religion's best friends, but religion's not necessarily their best friend. Mm. And, you know, so one spring day, uh, she was out, we were out in an open area, and her son was there, he's about three years old. And he was having a big time, and then he got over to where the cars were parked, mm. you know, on a street, both sides of the street, and there's a car coming down the street really fast. And he's going out between the cars. And then she notices him just at the last moment. What did she say? Oh my God! That's what she said. Oh my God! And the car slammed on its brakes and it screeched and there was crying and yelling. And he escaped by an inch of his life. You see, and then and this is what the Quran says, that anyone who calls upon God in dire need, he will answer their prayer. That was istighatha, which she did, which is coming out of what? Her fitrah. But when the fitrah is veiled over, it only shows itself to be what it is uh, in times of great fear. Mm. And this was a time of great fear. I can't lose my son. And also times of great joy. And, that can, and they say there's no disbeliever in the foxhole. So, but the ability of the fitra to come back, this is very hopeful for us, isn't it? And this is one of the important things about studying the fitra because people can get so far away from it. And every, we can take a thousand different paths, but you can come back to it actually very easily. Right. SubhanAllah. Mm -hmm. The, um, you know, about women, I, I like that, that uh, they're, the best friends of religion, but religion is not always their best friend. And that's something for centuries, mm -hmm. women were seen that their nature was inferior mm -hmm. to male nature. Mm -hmm. Aristotle asserts that, mm -hmm. and, and um, that was certainly, mm -hmm. you'll find that creeping up in both Christian mm -hmm. and in Muslim mm -hmm. um, texts. Mm -hmm. And there's a very interesting verse, I think it's in Zukhruf, about um, it says, mm -hmm. And it's, it, it's mm -hmm. articulated in the masculine, mm -hmm. um, and yet most mm -hmm. of the Mufassirun, Tabari, mm Mujahid, -hmm. uh, most, most of them say it's talking about women. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it uses the Mabni al Majhul, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that they are enculturated mm -hmm. into ornaments, mm -hmm. you know, ornamentation, that mm -hmm. they're mm -hmm. put up as mm -hmm. ornaments, women. And then they, it, it, they have an inability to mm -hmm. articulate that it, it mm -hmm. indicates essentially that it is enculturation, that there's a, mm -hmm. a nurturing element. And then if you remove mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. because if, if we say the mm -hmm. woman's nature is inferior, like it has been asserted by many, many people mm -hmm. in the past, then it leaves it, mm -hmm. uh, it's irremediable. You can't, mm -hmm. you can't alter that fact. But if it's understood as a nurture thing, which we clearly mm -hmm. see, especially mm -hmm. in, in, in the 20th mm -hmm. century, where mm -hmm. women have been given mm -hmm. equal opportunity to, in fact, mm -hmm. in many ways, they're exceeding the men now mm -hmm. uh, at a lot of universities. Mm -hmm. I think you saw that when you were in teaching in the Middle East, that right. the women were far the women superior. Were the best students. They were the best students. In right? fact, my whole academic career, women are the best students. Right. I mean, that's... that's Maybe even at Zaytuna. That's been our experience, I think, mm -hmm. at Zaytuna. Men, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you got to get to work. Mm -hmm. but, but that's a clear example mm -hmm. of where a, a complete mm -hmm. misunderstanding about mm -hmm. uh, these differences mm -hmm. between 
male and female led mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. oppression even mm -hmm. from within religious mm -hmm. traditions mm -hmm. and where that was understood mm -hmm. to be a nurture phenomenon which mm -hmm. I think that ayah mm -hmm. in the Quran mm -hmm. indicates and I think that's mm -hmm. why it's put mm -hmm. into the masculine mm -hmm. that the same would happen to a man mm -hmm. who was raised in that environment mm -hmm. where he's not allowed to mm -hmm. uh, to have his intellect nurtured mm -hmm. because he's more an, an ornament mm -hmm. for, for, for the mm -hmm. male. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, when we look at the prophetic history, um, uh, there was this clear cultural difference between the women of Mecca, the Quraysh, and the women of Medina, where the Prophet went in his migration. And the women of Medina were extremely articulate, and they were warriors on the battlefield. Right. And, of course, there are women who live in an agrarian culture because right. Medina was a huge oasis. And usually when women and men are doing the same thing, then they're extremely compatible. And that's certainly the way it was with the Medinese women. Uh, we, we had a Zawiya not long ago, just a few weeks ago in Egypt, and we had our sister Maryam Shaibani. I hope, people, hope she didn't mind me mentioning her name. But uh, she actually took hadith about women and studied them very carefully and showed how they're often misinterpreted, but that that's not really the valid interpretation. Right. And, um, you know, so, but the women of Medina were extremely strong and uh, very outspoken. And this is a Meccan surah that you're referring to. So you would think, what would come in my mind is it is talking to the Meccans in terms of their own right. culture. And the women of Mecca, they were very different because also the city lives by uh, international trade. And it lives also by the pilgrimage. And although women partook in that, uh, the men are the ones who really do it. So their, their women tend to be much more subdued. They could also go on the battlefield, by the way. But they weren't the kind of warriors that the Medinese women could be. So, um, but we do believe that men and women have these perfect natures. And, um, you know, that um, the women are not debilitated in any way by their nature. And in Islamic law, you know, it is a societal obligation that women get knowledge, every type of knowledge, right. religious knowledge, just like men. Well, I, I think Ibn Arabi would even mm -hmm. argue that they have spiritual advantages over men. Uh, that's what they say. Ibn Arabi, even in one part of the Futuhat Makiya, um, he talked about a saint, a man saint, who spoke to God with a, with a feminine voice. And I had the honor of reading that with a Moroccan scholar, and he explained to me that this is very common in that tradition, that, you know, the, and that, you know, if you don't have that feminine voice, you can't really attain the highest spiritual level. One of the good books, by the way, uh, you know, that for people interested in that, is the Tao of Islam. Right, Sachiko Murata. Right, by Murata. Mm. Uh, it is the first thing she wrote. She was a Japanese convert to Islam. And it's a very good book. The translations are really good mm. in Arabic and in Persian. But later on, she would discover Chinese Islam. And uh, then she becomes one of the authorities in Chinese Islam. If she had only had that knowledge of Chinese Islam, the book would have been even more beneficial than it is. But the Tao of Islam is a very, very amazing book to read. Mm. And it's about the male principle and the female principle. You have, um, mm. in, in the pre-modern world, I think, as far as I can tell, most civilizations agreed that there was a human nature. Certainly mm -hmm. the Islamic did, mm -hmm. uh, even the, the Indic and the Buddhist mm -hmm. traditions would have understood that mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Buddha nature was a potential mm -hmm. uh, that could be realized in, mm -hmm. in any human being. You, mm -hmm. you also have, uh, certainly in the Christian tradition, the idea of human nature. They, mm -hmm. they, they might differ on certain aspects of mm -hmm. its potentialities, but essentially the idea of a unified nature. Mm -hmm. Since the Enlightenment period, people like Hume, um, who reject human nature, and then in the 20th century, mm -hmm. you get, like, Merleau-Ponte says something like, 
Um, the only mm -hmm. nature that humans share is that they share no nature. Mm -hmm. Or you get somebody mm -hmm. like Ortega y Gasset, who also denies human nature. And, and I think modern, there's in fact Pinker, mm -hmm. who, who's at Harvard, uh, Stephen Pinker, mm -hmm. uh, wrote a book called The Blank Slate, um, mm -hmm. arguing that, that there is a human nature mm -hmm. and very troubled mm -hmm. by this negation or denial of mm -hmm. human nature. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we're seeing now mm -hmm. is the idea of a fluid nature, mm -hmm. that human mm -hmm. beings um, can, can, they might be born into the wrong body, for instance. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. I have a, a, a fe I'm a female trapped mm -hmm. in a man's mm -hmm. body. And, Instead mm -hmm. of seeing that maybe as uh, dysmorphia or some type mm -hmm. of uh, mental illness that needs to be treated, mm -hmm. it's now being embraced even in children, and children mm -hmm. are being encouraged. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, I think in Sweden, they're doing non-gender mm -hmm. uh, child rearing, mm -hmm. where the children wear the same clothes, the traditional mm -hmm. pink and blue, for instance, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that people would, if it was a girl, they would give at the mm -hmm. wedding, um, shower, they mm -hmm. would give all these nice girly type things. Mm -hmm. And this is the argument that this is simply enculturation, that mm -hmm. this is nurtural, mm -hmm. not natural, mm -hmm. and that, that the nature mm -hmm. of, uh, in fact, uh, Crowley, Alistair Crowley, uh, in the Book of the Law, chapter 2, argues over 100 years ago that the time is coming soon when we will be free of this binary, mm -hmm. and we will be able to choose our own mm -hmm. genders. So this mm -hmm. is something that we're really seeing happening mm -hmm. all over mm -hmm. now, and young people are really encouraged. I actually saw an East Asian man, if you can believe this, I saw a Pakistani man with a nose ring, and I, I was amazed at that, because I think in that culture, I think m maybe in some of the Hindu castes or something, I don't know, mm -hmm. but in that culture, mm -hmm. um, a man would not wear a n nose ring, mm -hmm. as far as I know. But mm -hmm. the, this mm -hmm. is kind of the throwing off of cultural decorum mm -hmm. and this idea how, how mm. would you address that just from mm. this denial of human nature that we're seeing yeah. in the 20th century and the mm -hmm. 21st century? Um, you know, that on the level of the horizontal, which is, you know, if you live in a world where you only explain things by reference to other things like them, that's like a horizontal universe, then there is no meaning there. And there there are no immutables, and there's no truth either. And atheism, agnosticism, they require a horizontal world. And once you put in the vertical connection, which is to look up to heaven and to look to first principles, the law of non-contradiction, the excluded middle, the law of identity, causality, possibility, necessity, impossibility, then you've got a tent. And then you have a structure, and then you have also meaning. So um, a lot of the things that we see in our time is because of this Cartesian worldview that we have, where we don't even know what's out there, we don't even know that it is out there, we can't relate to it, and you know, so you have these, all these social experiments. And most of these social experiments um, around gender, they go back also, it's very important to study the genealogy of ideas. So that is a complex issue. Uh, Descartes is the one who gives us the concept of mind in its modern sense, and his is sexless, which is something we'd say is a fundamental mistake. But, and that's also important, genderless. But uh, you have Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, Wilhelm Reich, R-E-I-C-H, the sexual revolutions from him, yeah, right. and he means revolution. He means revolution, and you only win that revolution when incest is best. Okay, it's, it's, it's got to go there. And then you have also Herbert Marcuse. He was a big deal here in Berkeley in the 1960s, Eros and Civilization and so forth. And then you have Judith Butler. And of course, what you're talking about, as you know. Judith, Judith's right next door. She is. She's next door, yeah. I didn't know that. I yeah. thought she was in Israel. No, no, she teaches here at UC Berkeley. Okay, I didn't know that. But So it's very important to know who gave you this idea and where did they get it from and what are their first principles. And so much of modern thought doesn't even have first principles. Right. 
And therefore, for us, uh, we want to get our orientation correct, and we want to know why do we believe what we believe? Where do we begin? How does the intellect work? Most people don't even know today what intellect is. Intellect doesn't need anything outside of itself. And of course, you've heard about that in the debunking of the syllogism and things like that, but that's not, not true. In any universal statement like existence and non-existence, right. the syllogism works perfectly because you have excluded middle. You mm. distribute the middle term. And you know, so um, for us, you know, and I think this is one of the great things about Zaytuna is that we learn our tradition, where we get our ideas and how we know them. And we also learn that the West is a tradition. Right and that these ideas don't drop out of the sky. There are certain people that are behind them, and I feel that one of the most eloquent ways to address these issues and most objective ways is look at where the ideas come from. Um, the, um, the, the idea of first principles, and mm -hmm. again, that's getting to something that mm -hmm. is deeply rooted in the mm -hmm. essential nature mm -hmm. of, of the human being, mm -hmm. the law of non-contradiction. That's fitra also for us. It's a fitra, yeah. The, you, know the, you know the law of non-contradiction. Mm -hmm. You know the law of the excluded middle. Right. You know the law of identity. You know that this is Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Um, this is Sheikh Abdullah. They're not right. the same. I, when it's I, not like you are now him, he's now you. When I taught logic, mm -hmm. um, Mm. I taught mm. them here that the mm. law of identity was Popeye's law. I am's what I am. <laughs> <laughs> I am what I am, and that's all that I am. Yeah. But um, these are very important. And if you look at most modern thought, if you look at Stephen Hawking, you know, um, you know the theory of everything, it's because everything's a model. Right. And Stephen Hawking even says this chair is not a chair. It's probably a molecular structure, probably. And my model is what makes it a three-dimensional brown chair. So this is Cartesian dualism. And well, therefore... And it's also, it's, it's the Kantian, mm -hmm. this idea that there's no correspondence. Because I think Muslims yeah. were very much committed mm -hmm. to correspondence truth. And that's that, exactly what the fitra is. You see, yeah. that, that's why the fitra also... The, yeah. See, the fitra, it enables you to know the world. Right. Because you've got it in you. Uh, you know, we say, critiques of modern science, they say that physics doesn't believe in red apples, okay, because um, it just believes there are molecular structures that you make into an apple, and it tastes sweet, and it nourishes you, but it's all about probabilities, and... Um, and, and this leads to a type of um, Gnosticism, mm. there, there, and, and I think mm. we're very much in a Gnostic, uh, mm -hmm. world in, mm -hmm. in many ways, even despite the materialism, mm -hmm. there, there's a, a, an occult mm -hmm. element that's very strong, this, this idea that none of this is real, that mm -hmm. we can't know reality, mm -hmm. that, um, that this, mm -hmm. this might be just simply mm -hmm. a, a solipsistic mm -hmm. uh, worldview in my yeah. head. We've got young mm -hmm. people now mm -hmm. going in and shooting up people in mm -hmm. schools, mm -hmm. and it it's mm -hmm. a complete divorce of reality that, mm -hmm. that, that they're not really inflicting pain on other people. There's something, it's mm -hmm. almost like they're in a matrix mm -hmm. and they perceive it as a kind of uh, mm -hmm. a, a game that mm -hmm. they're doing. So, mm -hmm. and that's a very demonic mm -hmm. uh, reality, I think, mm -hmm. that's being, mm -hmm. a lot of people are experiencing. And I think one of the, it's very interesting that it's very related to film and these mm -hmm. games that mm -hmm. people are playing mm -hmm. where they, I mean, the, the Decalogue, the, pro, the second prohibition in the Decalogue, which, um, and I know you know this book, that uh, in, in uh, Amusing Ourselves to Death, Neil Postman. It's a really good book. Yeah, the second chapter where he <laughs> talks <laughs> about what, why, would a, mm. why would there be a prohibition on making graven images? Mm -hmm. You know, this whole idea, because we've entered into a completely image-based mm -hmm. civilization where the word is, is being moved. Mm -hmm. We're even speaking mm -hmm. now in icons, mm -hmm. you know, in, in mm -hmm. these, these, these uh, mm -hmm. that w once you lose, w when you enter mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. that image-based culture, mm -hmm. you lose the ability t for abstraction, mm -hmm. for real abstraction, the ability to, to, to understand 
essences like the chair, to understand what makes a chair and why, despite the fact that you can have chairs that are, you take a dog, the idea that you can have a chihuahua and a Great Dane and see the dogginess that they share is amazing. Like that human beings can do that. And, and, and seeing the mm -hmm. also human mm -hmm. nature, despite the fact we can look mm -hmm. at somebody in the Amazon or somebody in, in, uh, in, in an aboriginal culture that are completely different from us in their expression of their humanity, and yet we can still abstract that essential human nature and see that this too is a human being. Uh, th that's being lost in people. It's, mm -hmm. you know, the, the image-based mm -hmm. culture where people are divorced mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. enter into this. I mean, I, I, I see it as, a, with no offense to people afflicted with this, but a kind of autism that, you know, the Arabs translated it as tawahud, you know, this idea of going into the, to the individual self and losing a sense of, of other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, we get our humanity, I think, you know, from uh, looking people in the eyes and um, having their companionship from our mothers, our great-grandmothers, our grandmothers, our aunts, from the men and so forth of our families. And what happens to people who are raised on video games and iPhones and things like that and who get their, or Facebook or whatever, I remember a girl that was with us in Spain, in Rosales, who's the daughter of one of our brothers, and a really amazing girl, but it's as if she couldn't even socialize with the other teens that were there. It's always her phone. It's like if you want to talk to her, send her a text. And um, one of our brothers in Chicago, who's a neurologist, he told me about this syndrome that they have. You probably know the name of it, I forgot. But it's like people bump their head today and they have to go see him. It's like I have memory loss. And he said they, they call this some kind of a psychological disorder. Like Mun Munchausen syndrome? Sorry? Munchausen syndrome. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, again, I'm not a neurologist, so I can't really say anything about what's what. He's the one who deals with these. Well, we grew up in a very different yeah. world. But um, my belief, and this is just an intuition, is that they're actually having memory loss. Right. Because it's like they're extremely weak, they're extremely vulnerable. Because, you know, whatever strength we have, in my opinion, is because, you know, we were with human beings. And these human beings gave us our humanity. And they gave us our ability to meet with trials and tribulations. And, and so this is, uh, you know, one of the things, of course, that we are conscious of, we need to be very conscious of, is what does this technology do to our primordial self? Because that primordial self needs to be nurtured by other human beings who have that nature. And, uh, you know, so this is very important in our time. And, you know, to learn to use our technology very, very intelligently and very wisely. Of course, it gives us tremendous benefits. You know, I'm able to be here because of technology. You're able to hear me because of the technology. We're being filmed on it, you know, so I don't believe that we, I think we should be thankful for it. You know, but at the same time, we have to know how to use it. And this is one of the things which, one of the great books on technology is Jacques Ellul. Right. This was one of our classics back in the old days. And Jacques Ellul warns about, you know, how technology sets its own rules. It goes its own direction. And I think the Jacques Ellul's book is a little bit problematic because we don't want to make people so pessimistic, right. you know, that they can't deal with the world they live in. But, you know, we have to, and this is one of the things Elu says, is that the massification of society is required for technology to have its march. So you have to break down significant religious and social groups who could apply principle. Right. And this is why also for us, as people that should be principled, we want to be principled, then we have to also learn about these things. How do they affect us? How are we going to use them? And, uh, and, and to live in a way that's beneficial. How many of our people are destroyed on social media, right? Dr. Jackson, who many of you know, he said that social media is not going to leave us a single leader. 
a, a single value, a single principle. Well, the t also the, I mean, one of, mm -hmm. one of the problems is this idea of the neutrality of technology. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that, um, mm -hmm. w one of the most important influences for me on that, because, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've talked a lot about mm -hmm. how, I, I've been talking for years about the problem of, of, uh, of image-based media mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and long before mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. what it's come to now, because mm -hmm. I, this mm -hmm. was pre-internet. Mm -hmm. Um, there, there's a book that Zbigniew Brzezinski wrote called Between Two Ages, which he wrote in 1969. Mm -hmm. And he talks about the introduction of technology, because he was aware, they were very aware of the internet and all these things. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, our, our, the US military mm -hmm. has technologies that we don't, we don't even know about. Mm -hmm. uh, and the internet, they were using the internet uh, in the universities, I think in 1969. Oh. Or, or 70 was uh, when, 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 when it begins. The actual mm -hmm. first, the first um, transmission was from UCLA, I think, to Stanford. And it was, they were gonna put um, like uh, log, mm -hmm. uh, L-O-G, and it crashed after L-O. So it was like low and behold. <laughs> And, and one of the things, I mm. saw Werner Herzog's um, amazing documentary on the internet, and the first half mm. is all the positive aspects of it, how mm. amazing it mm. is, which it is, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, like my dictionary app, mm. I just, mm. I use it all the time. And it's, and it's, it's so cool, it's so it's, easy. It's just amazing it to, to have it. And then, yeah. and then to have like all these Arabic mm. dictionaries uh, uh, literally in the palm of your hand, mm. it's unreal. But the second half was on the dangers of the internet. And one of the things, that, there's something really floored me was this lady and I felt like, you know, Ghazali when the thief um, tells him he laughs at him when he says, you can't steal all my knowledge. I just spent two years like, writing it all down. And the thief laughed at him and said, what kind of knowledge is it that a thief can steal it from you? And, and he said, antaqahu Allah, ladhi antaqahu He knew that God made him say that. Mm -hmm. And he vowed never to, he would always memorize after that everything that he learned. Mm -hmm. But um, there's a woman in there, it's a family, and it's one of the most depressing parts of this documentary, but they're all, they look very depressed. And, and, and the woman, they lost a, a daughter in a horrific car accident, and she had her head severed, oh and it was hanging off her body. But these looky-loos who drove by took pictures of it, <laughs> and then they posted it on the internet. And then over time, people kept sending them to her to the family. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she, here's what she said, and it mm -hmm. really floored me when she said it, because I felt like mm -hmm. Allah. She said, that, I think that the internet, I think the spirit of the Antichrist has descended into mm -hmm. the internet, and people that are susceptible to it, it just opens up a kind of vileness. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just so interesting mm -hmm. how vile people are. Mm -hmm. on, I mean, just cruel. There's so mm -hmm. much cruelty. You know, one of the things I have, I've been asking somebody from Silicon Valley, maybe an engineer here, I want a, a computer a program mm. that automatically erases anything done on the internet that is grammatically incorrect. Because it would eliminate 99.9% .9 of the trolls, because they always write in bad grammar. But be that as it may, there's something, I think it's in uh, Thess Thessalonians. I, I'm, I'm not sure, I think it's in Second Thessalonians where Paul talks about the mystery of iniquity um, and, and, and the man of lawlessness, uh, the, the person towards the end of time. You know, and this is obviously a reference to the Antichrist, mm -hmm. but he says mm -hmm. the mystery of iniquity is already active mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. And we have a tradition in our own uh, tradition where the Prophet said that there's no fitna that has occurred since the beginning of time except that it's preparing for the greatest fitna, this antichristic period where people completely divert from their nature and, and, and the fitra is really so perverted that people lose it. And so this, what's happening now with so many people turning away 
from faith and godlessness being celebrated and profanity being celebrated. The idea of, of mocking uh, religion, which would have been so unacceptable not that long ago in most cultures in the world. Now it's something, it's, it's just, it is the bread and butter of comedians. It's, 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 it's the Hollywood, um, you know, j everything is just really just making religion seem like such a dark thing. And there's so many young people now you know, they say I'm spiritual but not religious, or they don't want to have anything to do with organized religions. I always tell them to join Islam because we're the most unorganized religion <laughs> there is. But um, yeah. anyway, what 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 do you what do you th what do you say about that? Because the Prophet said one of the signs of that precedes the Antichrist is people stop talking about the Antichrist. That's right. They, they... And 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 it seems like mm. we're in a very anti-Christic mm. world where. Mm. Mm -hmm. So the you know the the word that we use of course for the antichrist is a dajjal, and um, belief in him is obligatory, um, and it comes from dajjal, and dajjal means to lie, to you know confuse, to turn things up down upside down. Some of our scholars say that uh, what the dajjal does is he. Uh, overturns the, the very principles of knowledge so that you, you no longer know that what is true is true and what is false is false. And this is the age we live in because we don't have, even like if we look at Descartes, I think therefore I am. Okay, well that changes the whole history of human thought because in traditional medieval thought, existence comes first. Right. And in, we, our, yeah. in our tradition also, existence comes first. Yeah and then epistemology. Right. So now for him, epistemology comes for us and then we don't really know if we exist or not. So we should say, I am, mm -hmm. therefore I should think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. or some people say, I am, therefore God exists. But, um, you know, uh, overturning the, what we call immutables. Immutables are first principles. Immutables also for us are the basic principles of prophetic law, the dispensation and the basic principles of um, theological truth, necessary being, possible existence, a change indicates temporality, and then the basic thawabit of uh, suluk, of the moral path of self-perfection. So these don't change, but the dajjal makes them change. And then you have the immutables made mutable and this gives you the disasters, which are the ugly signs of the end of time. As the prophet said, you know, the slave girl will give birth to her mistress or her master. And um, you'll see barefoot, naked, uh, poor shepherds vying for each other, sometimes camel shepherds vying for, with each other in the building of tall buildings. So you see that, but then when we look at it, we say many people, probably most, they say that, you know, the mother will give birth to a daughter who would treat her like a slave. And, uh, of course, we see that today. And, you know, and then you can see the buildings. You can go look at them, so, them yourself. One of the signs of the end of time is, إِذَا بُعِجَتْ مَكَّةْ إِذَا رَأَيْتَ مَكَّةَ بُعِجَتْ كَوَاظِمْ When you see Mecca gutted with tunnels and you see tall buildings, over the tops of the mountain, then know that the hour has cast its shadow over you. Right. You can go and see the hour doing that right now, yeah. the big tower. But um, they call that Burj Saad. They the, call it the, the tower yeah, of the hour. That's, that's frightening, isn't yeah. it? I went to Mecca the first time in 1973. There wasn't a single tunnel anywhere. Yeah. It's like where they come from. But you see, then what happens is why does the girl treat her mother as a slave, or the boy treat his mother as a slave? or as a slave that's mistreated because the thawabit are gone. That they don't have sound belief, they don't know first principles, um, they don't have the morality. Okay, so all that's, and then when that's done, then she will do whatever she wants to do. And the same thing, you look at the shepherds vying with each other in tall buildings, so it means certain thawabit have been overthrown. And among these are a sound political order 
which should put people in power who are capable of leading and who lead us for our benefit and not their own. And then you have also overthrowing a sound economic system in which there is distribution of wealth. So you get all this wealth concentrated in the hands of shepherds. Many of those shepherds, as Sheikh Hamza knows, are very good people. You know, but they're not the cloth that you make leaders from in a time like this. They can't deal with that. So the Dajjal, this is what he does. He takes the Thawabit, the immutables, and makes them mutable and changes them in a thousand different ways. Right. Uh, the, you know, Christ mm -hmm. said to the woman accused of adultery, mm -hmm. you know, where are your accusers? Because they all left. Mm -hmm. And then he said, go and, and sin no more. Mm -hmm. and, and this is an age where mm -hmm. it's go, there is, do what thou wilt, for there is no more sin. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the idea that um, the, mm -hmm. the, the concept of mm -hmm. sin is being mm -hmm. removed mm -hmm. from the world. And anything that I do is my own business, mm -hmm. um, that I am a, an autonomous agent uh, that nobody can tell me what to, as long as I don't, you know, the harm principle. As long as I don't hurt anybody, then I can do what I want. Um, I'm, I, I want to, because we're, we're, the, we're, the time's uh, coming to a close, but I want to, the, the Quran, in, in the verses that you quoted um, from Surah al rum it says uh, that this is the fitra of, of God, the, the, the principal nature that God has created the human being on. Um, and, and then it's التي فطر الناس عليها that God has فطر he's al فاطر you, you actually wrote mm -hmm. about that in, in, mm -hmm. in your book about mm -hmm. that name which mm -hmm. is a very interesting name mm -hmm. of God. Um, and and uh, I think it was Ibn Abbas didn't know what it meant and he heard the the Bedouin mm -hmm. saying, Ana so. fatartuha, you know, mm -hmm. I, I mm -hmm. dug the well before you, so mm -hmm. I was the first one. So fatara mm -hmm. is to make mm -hmm. it first or the, mm -hmm. the original. And mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting, we call aboriginals, you know, from mm -hmm. the origin of man. Mm -hmm. They have that. Um, but it, it then it says, la tabdila li khalqillah. And, and you alluded to the difference of opinion, but Ibn, Ibn Juzay, uh, preferred the opinion that it was, the, the, the negation there was for prohibition and not impossibility. You know, like, la nafil al jins. It, it wasn't la nafil al jins, it was la nahi. Do not change, it's a warning to change, do not change. And what we're seeing now is an incredible in the West and increasingly uh, affecting people in the East. What we're seeing now is a real change of this fitra, that, that it's being altered uh, in people. And, and how, what, what advice would you give mm -hmm. us mm -hmm. to protect that mm -hmm. principial nature, mm -hmm. to nurture it? I mean, we have this idea of tahliya, tahliya and tajliya, the, the emptying out of a of, of vicious character and the, the, the filling mm -hmm. up of virtuous character in order to experience the divine. If you look at the hadith uh, that are on the fitrah, and I have those in my book, uh, one of the things we see in them is that there's nothing easier for us than to live according to our natures. You know, and um, it's very easy for us to do that. And um, there are a thousand ways back to your nature. And uh, the traditional Islamic city was a garden city. And to be a valid city in Islam, according to law, you have to have land, you have to have water on that land or above it, you have to produce all the food you need for your city in your city. You can't depend on the outside. Okay, but we were garden cities and we had animals and uh, lots of animals. And we have a whole law about green zones and things like that that enable us to support those animals. And we believe in our tradition, I believe according to my teachers in our tradition, that without animals you can't be human. Right. You know, chickens are amazing. And if you do permaculture, you know how amazing they are. Yeah. You know, and chickens will teach you a lot. 
Mm -hmm. uh, all animals would do that. So I think getting back into the natural world, um, you know, we, you're going to have this program on permaculture with our brother Ramiz Kent, uh, May the 21st till June the 2nd, yeah. I think. And um, we had one in Spain last summer and we made soil. You can make soil in 18 days. You need three parts of carbon, which can be sticks. You need two parts of nitrogen, which can be green grass. And you need then something else that catalyzes it like manure. Okay, one part. And then again, three, two, one, three. And you water it properly. So it's not too wet, it's not, it's not too dry. And it, it's, it's steaming in one day. It's full of life. In order to have healthy food, you have to have living soil, not just nutrients. You know, this is one thing they learned in the organic movement, and they learned it from Muslim India, by the way. The organic movement comes out of Muslim India. And, you know, so, um, you know, making soil, you know, you should be a producer, not just a consumer. Of course you're a consumer. A lot of beautiful things to consume, you know, but if you're a producer, that's a revolutionary act. You can do it in your apartment. And um, I think of all the things we did in that Zawiya, making the soil captivated people more than anything else. Mm. And, um, you know, I know of an example of a young man in Australia. He's Lebanese. Um, he came to Leba into Australia because of the Lebanese Civil War. Uh, there are a lot of Lebanese like that in Australia, most of them from the north, from Tripoli and other areas. He felt he was treated like, you know, by a ra you know, in a very racist way. At least he felt that way. And he didn't think he owed anything to Australia. And he actually said, I hate this country, even though it took you in as a refugee. And um, he was taken out, uh, you know, to learn about the soil, do some permaculture, plant trees. And in the act of planting a tree, you know, he put his hand in the ground and he said that um, when I put my hand in the ground, everything changed. And he said, I began to love this country and I began to feel that I'm part of it. So contact with the soil, contact with animals, mm. contact with nature, contact with each other, with other human beings, talking, visiting, these are very important. Yeah. These bring us back to our nature. There are a lot of things. I would also say martial arts. And there are all kinds of martial arts as I'm sure everybody here knows. But martial arts do something for you. One of the big problems with males in particular is that we don't have initiations. You know, whereas in traditional societies you have initiation that enables you to move from being a boy to being a man. Women often don't need that because their biological changes are so powerful that they serve as initiations. But, um, you know, getting back to nature, um, you know, you should learn the language of nature. The Aborigines, who are incredible people, incredible, incredible culture, you know, um, they teach children to listen. And if a child asks a question, they say, go ask your mother. Mm. What do they mean? Go listen to nature. Listen to what nature says about this. Yeah. So, and you can do that here. You have this incredibly beautiful environment. You can find yourself a sitting spot in the forest. You know, people even tell you the best ways to do that. Learn the language of the forest. Learn the language of the birds. The birds will come to look at you. Hmm. Other animals will come to check you out. So these things are very good for us. You know, getting in your body. You know, getting out of, in, in dream time for Aborigines is being in the center brain. Hmm. It's not just about dreaming. It's about being out of this analytical brain that's always worrying and always analyzing and, con and concerned about stuff. You know, get into the center brain. So uh, I, I just think it's very easy to come back to the Fitra. I gave you the example of our brother Uthman in Spain. And many of us have seen this in our own lives. I mean, look at Malcolm X, you know, how this man changed so incredibly. After the pilgrimage, his voice was even different. Mm. You know, so we believe in that fitra. This is a belief. It's obligatory for us. Mm. And again, this affects the way we look at the world. Mm. That there's no one out there who is foreign to us. There's no one out there who's alien to us. And, um, 
you know, may we benefit, you know, in learning our tradition. Again, one of the great dangers of this time, and this is, you know, one of the things we have to be very conscious about in secular institutions is epistemic warfare, mm. you know, which is warfare against your epistemology. And this is what they did, the Aborigines, like you're not even human beings, you're not even animals, you're like plants. You can cut down the plant, you can take away its sibling, you can take away the little plants, that's what they did. You know, but the Abor and ep epistemic warfare means your tradition cannot generate knowledge. I spent hours with the Aborigines in, a, in Australia and with ones who were like basically spirit doctors. Everything they say is knowledge. Mm. You know, for example, they don't have a word for health. They have a word for healing. And that's because you have to heal yourself every day. You have to get that negativity out of you, you know, that's in you. And it's just incredible. But also, you know, when we defend our tradition, it's not because, it shouldn't be, because we're romantic, it's not because we lament a lost past. No, it's because I know, and this man knows, and you know, that our tradition generates knowledge. Okay, so we can't allow other people who don't even know our tradition to say it doesn't. You belong in a museum, we'll give you a nice place in the museum. You did produce beautiful things. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, epistemic warfare is imperialism. And a lot of our institutions are that way. They're, they say they're liberal, but they're not liberal to anything that doesn't agree with, our, the, with the epistemic tradition that they have. And you, you're very blessed to be in this wonderful place, in this wonderful environment, um, some of the best libraries and, and minds in the world. And I really hope that this institution succeeds. And I believe it will. I'm amazed, because the last time I was here, I don't know how many years ago it was, maybe five or seven, but I remember coming into this place and it wasn't even used yet. Mm. But I mean, you know, this is a great gift that has been given to you. Mm. And you have great teachers, you know, many of whom I'm looking at right now. And um, may we continue to do this. And I believe myself that we are here to save humanity. You are the best community brought forth for human beings. Imam al-Bukhari says, You must be the best of all people to all people. And people today, they really, you know, how long will this last? How long will this last? You know, that, you know like we have schools in Naperville right now that one class has in it three suicides. I mean, that was unthinkable in the old days. Yeah. Suicide was virtually unthinkable. Oh, wow. yeah. You have one school that has 30 suicides. Mm. This is not right. Yeah. You know, the, these are vital signs that are being lost. And, you know, we have to bring ourselves to life, but we have to be life givers as well. And when we do that, we'll find there are a lot of good people in this society, mm. Christians and Jews and others you know, who are on the same page that we're on in that. Yeah. And inshallah, we work together in this. It's very important. And, you know, when we do the right things like permaculture, to me, it's win-win. You know, and not only is it win-win, that you then find that some of the best people in the world, you know, you, you get to know them. And uh, that benefits us a lot. MashaAllah. You know, I, I uh, just, when I, when I was in uh, Mauritania, mm -hmm. There was a, a sheikh there. His name was uh, Muhammad uh, Al Amin. They called him Minu. Mm -hmm. you know? And um, when I visited him, uh, I, I was staying in Sheikh Khattari Wal Bueba's house. And I, I think it was 22 or 3. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we used to go visit him. He, his dhikr was the Hisun al Hasin. He used to recite it every single day by memory, mm -hmm. the whole thing. And his dua was making dua for the Ummah. Mashallah. Like that's that's what he did. But he, he was I think in his 80s at mm -hmm. the time, and, and he told me, "I've never wished for anything mm -hmm. to be different than the way it was, mm -hmm. but today I wish what, I was a young man so I could go with you to Marabd al Hajj to study." Mm -hmm. And then he picked up uh, some earth, and he said, "Nasihati laka, la min hadhi ummukum." He said. 
my advice to you, don't get far away from this. This is your mother, yeah. the earth. And I think one of the things that technology is doing is it's really distancing people mm -hmm. from just being with, uh, with the earth. And we're fortunate to be in an incredibly beautiful mm -hmm. uh, environment here. There's a lot of places to go. So I think that's really good advice just mm -hmm. about um, mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. in, in, in nature. And we know mm -hmm. the Prophet Sallallahu mm -hmm. Alaihi Wasallam, he, he was very deeply connected to the natural world and that natural world spoke to him um, and, and, and he spoke back He's with Jabal Uhud, Jabal Uhud, Jabal Uhud, Jabal Uhud, Jabal Uhud, Jabal Uhud. Yeah, you know, um, walk barefoot in the grass. Yeah. It's incredible. It's incredible when, when it's not too cold. <laughs> You know? What did he say? Remind yourself, be like Ma'at ibn Adnan and walk barefoot sometimes. Right. Yeah, yeah. Sayyidina Omar said that. Even, you know, I mean, uh, even when you wear your shoes, you can imagine that you're walking barefoot. You're feeling the earth underneath you. These things are all very, very valuable to us. They're also very good for our health. You're getting rooted. Hmm. And... Um, Learning to be human beings again, right? That's one of the things we have to do. But I just emphasize, it's easy to do that. Mm. It's not difficult. Even though it might seem to you impossible. But this is one of the easiest things to do. That's also God's mercy. It's so easy to come back. And it's very difficult to astray, to go astray. Because the point where we're at right now, there was a lot of work put into that over a lot of generations. It didn't just happen overnight, mm. you know, and there's a lot of money invested in that as well. And it's very easy to come back and to be yourself and to be natural. And, you know, our religion is a religion of service and love. Mm. And service and love heal everything. One last um, point and question to you. Uh, you, you talked also about mm. beauty mm. and the importance of beauty. Mm -hmm. the, the, the Prophet mm -hmm. said, um, when the man asked him about was wearing nice clothes and a good mm -hmm. sandal, was that from arrogance? And he mm -hmm. said, no, it's, it's, it's Allah loves beauty. And, and, and one of the things that I, that I find really notable about pre-modern people is that they, they adorned things. They, they didn't have a lot of things generally, but what they did have, they always made beautiful. Um, and when I was in Mauritania, they started using Bic pens. Uh, their traditional pen was a bamboo pen, but they started using Bic pens. But the women would adorn them with leather and make them very beautiful. So they would actually take the plastic and they would just do a design on it and then put little frills at the end of it. And the students would write with these pens. And when I asked one of the women why they did that, she said, it's so ugly. You know, the big pen, you know, and, and what, mm -hmm. is, I, what is that mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. in humans that mm -hmm. why not mm -hmm. just have a functional carpet? Why mm -hmm. put the tree of life mm -hmm. on the carpet? Why mm -hmm. not just have functional mm -hmm. walls? Mm -hmm. Why put wainscoting with mm -hmm. designs mm -hmm. on, the, mm -hmm. on the, I mean, what is that? And how do mm -hmm. we restore that? Because mm -hmm. Muslims, mm -hmm. they dressed beautifully. Mm -hmm. Even peasants mm -hmm. um, dressed, be you know, mm -hmm. the Afghan embroidery and, and the, the sadriya that the Egyptian falah wears with the striped. W people really have become, um, they don't, you don't see the, 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 the caliphate of God in that, in, in that human being anymore. And, and how is that restored? In a traditional societies, you should, tell me any traditional society that was not beautiful. You know, look at the first nations of this land. I mean, look at the uh, Inuit, you know, the Eskimos, who are really a civilization. The Amran, that's a good example of Amran that doesn't have cities. But everything they did was beautiful. Look at the Aborigines. You can't believe how beautiful everything they, they, they make is. And we were like that too. We were a highly skilled society. We were a society of crafts and everything, guilds. And everything we made was beautiful. And that's because God is beautiful and he loves beauty. Beauty is the splendor of truth. You know, and that means God doesn't love ugliness. And ugliness is the 
mark of falsehood. Ugliness means you've gone astray. So, um, you know, getting this back, again, I believe it's going to be easy. And again, if we look at Zaytuna, and if we look at many of the brothers and sisters that are dear to us, look at the beauty they, 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 they create. You know, so God is beautiful. If you love God, you become beautiful. You become internally beautiful. That's the universal routing. And then what you produce is graceful and beautiful, even the way you walk, even the way you talk, even the words you use, because you want to use beautiful words. You want to know what your words mean. So um, this is very important, to get back this beauty and everything. And that makes us human. You know, that um, Al-Maturidi, who is one of our great theologians, he talks about how God holds us back from evil by putting us in a natural setting. We still do evil, but the natural setting is telling us this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. What happens, however, when you put people in an ugly setting of broken windows, you know, um, you know, uh, broken glass, you know, graffiti, you know, um, rats, so forth, you can't believe there's such a thing as truth anymore. You can't believe that there's any, such a thing as goodness anymore. And that's why beautification is something we have to do to ourselves. And in Islamic art, I, I believe the highest form of art is architecture. Uh, architect, and, and in our tradition, architecture is what generates so many other forms of incredible art. You know, but our art, according to some, it begins with clothing. Some would say it begins with the mihrab, the recitation of the Qur'an, the writing of the Qur'an, but clothing is one of the first things. And we, we believed in beautiful clothing. And who didn't? All traditional people were like that. You know? And it showed their identity, it showed their honor, and it showed what they believe in, who they are. You know? But we wanted clothing that would be beautiful. We wanted clothing that also we could pray in and not be embarrassed. You, know, you look at the Eid prayers you know, in Nigeria, and you can put it in National Geographic, you look at us praying Eid prayers, it's like, please don't take a picture until we're, you know, <laughs> sitting up or standing up again, right? Except for the sisters. They're the ones that come off okay. Yeah. But, you know, we wanted also clothing that would look good, clothing that also we can do ablution with easily. And we made beautiful things. And, you know, in, in Pakistan, uh, those of you who have been to Pakistan or you're from Pakistan, they have in Rawalpindi this incredible museum called Lok Varsa. Mm. And Lok Varsa in Punjabi means the tradition of the people. And I, I went to that museum. Uh, the woman who took me, uh, she was a, one of the curators, she said, and I was, this is a question in my mind. And so she answered it without me asking it. And it's like she said, this is a museum designed to preserve the cultures of this land, not to destroy them. Because many people say that you know, being put in a museum is like Salat al Janaza. You know, it's it, that's the end of your culture. So he said, we don't want to do that. And then if you go there, you know, and you look at all these cultures in Pakistan, you know, Punjabi, uh, you know, Pashtuns, uh, you know, the, the Sindhis, there are all these different cultures, uh, and they're all beautiful. And everyone is distinctive. Everyone is distinctive. And they're so beautiful, it's like beyond words. Look at, look at what the Indonesians do, what the Malays do. But this is the way we were traditionally. You know, you go to Rosales, this beautiful retreat we have in Spain, and you have a tile which is to me one of the most beautiful tiles in the world. You know, it's an Andalusian tile, but it's called the breath of the most merciful. Mm. And the colors are soft, mm. you know. And uh, then you have what is called, uh, in a contracting square, which looks like a cross with points, and you have expanding square, which looks like, I guess, an octagon. Okay, inside, and that's, that's the breath of the most merciful, in and out. And, you know, so how did they develop that? And it's so simple, but, and especially, I do atikaf there in the last 10 days of, you know, Ramadan, if I can, and, you know, I just like to focus on those tiles. Because to me, they're spiritually therapeutic, right. right? So this is who we were, and this is who we are, and this is who we must be. And 
You know, beauty is our Ihsan. means, right? Yeah, Ihsan. Beauty, making beauty. Mm -hmm. And you know, this, again, you know, one of our teachers who studied metaphysics, we talked tonight about Maibudi and Qunawi and others. These are the greatest metaphysicians. They are spectacular. You know, but this man spent his life studying great metaphysicians. And that's not something that everybody can do. Not everybody can do rocket science. You know, but this man, he was visiting a particular place in Pakistan. Uh, I think Bari Imam or Bulli Shah, I don't know which one it was. And he's overstayed his time. So he came out, it was late at night. And he had to be taken to his hotel. And his hotel was a long ways away. And there's nobody there. And then out of the darkness came this uh, cart, uh, a cart driver. And those of you who know Urdu, you know what they call that cart. I always forget. And, um, you know, the cart driver, he said, if you looked at him, his clothes, um, you could buy all of them for one dollar in the market. And he was a poor man. And so he spoke to them. He didn't know Urdu, he knew Persian. He spoke to him in Persian and said, could you take me to the hotel? The man answered in Urdu. He could understand it because the languages are close. He got on the front seat of the cart with this poor man. And the man, who was he? This world is filled with amazing things. Began to recite to him from Hafiz and Rumi in perfect Persian. And he said, in those 45 minutes, I learned more about metaphysics than I learned in 30 years. So beauty is the language of truth also. And that's why, you know, even some of the things we talked about tonight, because it's put in an intellectual vocabulary, not everybody can understand that. But when you put that into poetry, when you put that into rhyme, when you put that into art and into beauty, you know, then everybody gets it. And beauty attracts you then to those meanings. This is why also our societies were so beautiful. And you know a lot about that. I remember going to uh, one of the great, I think it's the Selimiya, one of the great mosques of Sinan in Adirne, I think it is. And it's basically red. And I actually couldn't leave that mosque. It's like, this is the story of the whole universe. Mm. You see, it's like he's telling it in colors. He's telling it in symbols. He's telling it in shapes. But like, what have you done here? You see, so this pulls our souls to the truth. And ugliness does the opposite. And that's why we want to replace the ugliness with beauty. Thank you. Mm -hmm. On that note, um, I want to thank you, Dr. Omar, you. on behalf of the community here for coming this way. Also, uh, Haja Samira for coming and supporting you. May you have a blessed trip here. Uh, the Maurit Mauritanians say, La uh, Tarabas, inshallah. May you not see any evil. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless uh, Dr. Omar Abdullah Farooq and his family and his loved ones and keep him safe and preserve him. Inshallah, may we benefit from what we've heard tonight. And uh, may you all return to your uh, homes. Uh, safe and sound and and have a blessed sleep with some dream time inshallah may you say may, may you see beautiful things in your dreams tonight inshallah well, one of the signs of the end of time is uh, many beautiful dreams that are true mm. you see because this is one of the ways that God's merciful to you that you live in a world where so many people don't believe so he sends you these incredible dreams mm. so may you have beautiful dreams sweet yeah. dreams Inshallah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Allah yibarak fikum. Assalamu alaikum.